Yes. Tonight we've got a, something a little bit special and I'd like to um, introduce you to a special guest to present tonight's reading. Now, Dougal Stevenson probably started his television career in this building, so we'll just talk a little bit about him, not too much, um, because he will be up here shortly for, his, uh, for the story. When television's nightly news finally went nationwide in 1969, Dougal was the person chosen to read the first news bulletin. Six years later, Stephen, uh, Bert, uh, sorry, Dougal and Bill McCarthy were given alternating command of Television One's 6.30 news slot. These days, he's back here in Dunedin, broadcasting, acting, uh, looking after his cars, and uh, doing the Dunedin Diary Show uh, here on uh, Channel 9. So, welcome back to Dunedin, Dougal, and uh, I'd love you to come up here in a building you're probably really um, very familiar with and do our reading for tonight. Thank you very much. I think this used to be the shooting range. <laughs> Don't be tempted. As part of its 150th anniversary, the Chamber is producing a celebratory book. Over the year, our BA5, Business After Fives, several excerpts have been read out about some early Otago businesses. This evening's reading is about the Chamber itself. It's no coincidence that Otago business is sometimes referred to as the Tartan Mafia. It's been said already this evening, and our commercial forebears had to forge similar bonds and face off against rivals similar to those that fill any gangster movie. Imagine the context of the Chamber's early years, and this was a very early building in there. The discovery of gold in June of 1861 triggered a tidal wave of immigrants. Many came from the gold fields of Victoria, New South Wales, and California. To supply their needs came shiploads of merchants, manufacturers, <coughs> hoteliers, and surfing in their wake, not that they'd have known the expression, were the prostitutes, the thieves, and the sly groggers. <laughs> Enjoy your drinks in the dark. The Dunedin's <laughs> Presbyterian settlers were horrified that the face of their wee tune could change so dramatically, but they knew that it would be good for business. Family businesses like Hudson, Shacklock, and Hallenstein were born of this influx. Yet, as the boom was taking hold, Dunedin faced many challenges. Rapid population growth, inadequate jetty and harbour facilities, hastily erected buildings, no fire brigade, no railway, and rudimentary roads. You can forget about the information highway, it was more like a dirt track. Think your broadband is slow? Well, try waiting for news to come via horse or steamship. <laughs> These were the circumstances that brought Otago's leading businessmen together to help advance the growing settlement, as well, of course, as their own interests. The Dunedin Chamber of Commerce took form on the 23rd of August, 1861 and its first general meeting was held on the 13th of September that year, 150 years ago today. Throughout the 1860s and the 70s, the Chamber threw itself into the task of seeking civic and regional improvements to address the needs of a growing population and feed business activity. The gold fields were hungry for manpower. The rush attracted miners of all nationalities. But in the early years, the Chinese arrived. Many had suffered discrimination and ill-treatment in Australia, and they feared more of the same if they should relocate to New Zealand. Despite criticism from both sides of the Tasman, the Chamber worked to see that Chinese miners would enjoy the same protection under the law as any others, and the influx began. The Chamber of Commerce also facilitated exporting and importing, and since shipping was vital to growth, it took a strong interest in the development of Otago Harbour. In 1873, Chamber notables, including E.B. Cargill, J. Rattray, P.C. Neal, and the mayors of Dunedin and Port Chalmers, formed a committee that led to the establishment of the Otago Harbour Board. Despite, and uh, sometimes because of many fierce battles, facilities were built. Channels were dredged, and eventually Dunedin became home to the largest shipping business in the Southern Hemisphere. In its first quarter century, the Chamber flourished and prospered, 
by a period of Otago history rightly called the Golden Age. We may never see its like again. Dunedin was the young country's business and industrial capital. It boasted a quarter of the colony's population, as well as exports, and was its manufacturing powerhouse. Yet at the end of 1886, the Chamber of Commerce founded. It's incredible that a group that included some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in the country, land barons and bankers and captains of industry, could just cease to function. But the Chamber's small and medium-sized businessmen have always been a significant source of its vitality. Through their declining attendance, apathy and debt, the first incarnation of the Dunedin Chamber of Commerce was forced to close its doors and its books. But the business community's need for a strong advocate remained, and a year later, on the 25th of May, 1887, the Otago Chamber of Commerce was reformed with a new vigour. The Chamber's story since those early days is the story of its members, past and present, through the highs of the great exhibitions and huge government projects, the lows of the Great Depression, two world wars, and ever-changing political climate. The Chamber has always worked on behalf of and in conjunction with its members. When this family works together, it has power and purpose. And so we kiss the cheeks of those who have woven the fabric of the Tartan Mafia over the past 150 years. And to those wanting to weave the threads of the next 150, we say there's no better time than to start than now. Ochai the new. Thank you very much, Dougal. Someone who has led the Chamber um, from the front is our CEO. I've been on the board, I think, uh, almost right through since 1996. So I've seen uh, John grow from his... Uh, uh, Peter, Peter put it um, a lot more here than what he's got now, um, to, to the um, experienced CEO that we actually uh, see in front of us now. I'd like to call John to uh, the podium to uh, say a few words and tell a couple of stories. Thank you. I guess we should probably be worried, Devin, but <coughs> thank you. Today is a significant milestone for the Chamber. It is a day that marks the contribution of the Otago Chamber of Commerce to the city and the region for the last 150 years. We won't be going into too many more details about the Chamber's history, uh, but you can read all about that in our publication, which will be re released later this year. When planning this party, we <coughs> wanted to make it for the members and about the members. We know that you all enjoy the Business After Five format, uh, some of you far more than others, and we also wanted to give you the opportunity to participate in making tonight a showcase of our members, and you have, so thank you for that. I remember my first ever biz business after five. Can you remember yours? Mine was particularly scary. Um, not only did I not know anyone, but I worked for the chamber, and I couldn't sneak away early. It was difficult for a start, uh, but I came to realise pretty quickly that despite the suits and ties and women in formal work attire, business people in Dunedin were actually very welcoming, and generally quite receptive. It was me that needed the confidence to get involved in meeting new people. In essence, a chamber is all about you, the business community, whether it was 150 years ago or today. The purpose of the chamber hasn't changed, which is to lobby and advocate on behalf of the business community. The products that we offer have changed and will continue to change to reflect the services that you want from your organisation. I have had the pleasure of working for the Chamber since 1993, not quite the last 150 years, and I've worked alongside many great boards, chairs and staff that have all contributed greatly in servicing the needs of the business community, and indirectly the wider community at large. I thank them on your behalf for their valuable contributions. Many are here tonight, and it is great to know that you all still support the Chamber. About six months into working for the Chamber, my boss at the time, John Thorne, many of you will remember John, he called me into his office and asked if I had a passport. Luckily I did, because a couple of weeks later I was off on a New Zealand Chamber of Commerce trade mission through Southeast Asia. Sounds good, I guess, apart from the fact that I was not given any travel money, and the parting words of John Thorne were, whatever you do, don't piss off Michael Barnett. 
sitting partway through the trip at a hotel bar in Singapore, with a second round of drinks ordered, I nervously looked across at Michael, who knowing that the bar tab was probably a week's wages for me at the time, said, don't worry John, I've got this one. I guess I got on well with him then, and I have done ever since. We're very fortunate to have and are well served by Chamber CEOs in New Zealand, and we do belong to a very strong international network. We've received quite a few messages from those that couldn't attend tonight, including messages from the CEOs of the Taranaki, Waikato, Cambridge, Queenstown, Canterbury, Wellington, Auckland Chambers, and Mr. Sen Fu Rong from the Shanghai Chamber of Commerce. We've also had Claire Curran, Michael Woodhouse and Pete Hodson send messages. Uh, they obviously can't attend due to Parliament sitting this week. We've also received many messages from former staff, directors and members who could not make it tonight but wish us every success for the next 150th years, for 150 years. Thank you all for attending tonight as well. Can I conclude with a quote from the Chamber President who in our 100th um, publication wrote, land development, irrigation, roading, electricity, harbour facilities and development, encouragement of new industries, improved communications and transport, these are the many subjects which have regularly exercised the Chamber at executive and council level. The results have been most encouraging. To all those who have at various times served the Chamber of Commerce in a variety of capacities, may I say a simple but sincere thank you. The fruits of your labours are lasting. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. But no birthday party would be complete without the cutting of the cake. And we're going to do that now, but I'd like to invite forward, please, our two life members. Um, you know, say we've got plenty of other life members, but they're living life members. Dave Humphrey and Steve Brocklebank. It's always good to have Humphrey. <laughs> and and I, I would presume, Dave, that you've got something to say. I never have anything to say. You should know that. <laughs> Whenever I speak and Julian Smith's here, I normally say I am standing up. Save some even to remind me. <laughs> now I've got here a naval officer's sword. Fifty years ago this year, on the 23rd of March actually, I was in England commissioning a new ship, Taranaki. One of our, one of our excuse me, new warships. And uh, in the commissioning ceremony, the, the um, commander-in-chief's wife in, the, in England was going to cut the commissioning cake. And I had a new sword. I was a newly commissioned officer. So they said, can you, can we borrow your sword? So I gave her my sword. Little did I know that when I drew the sword, it was covered with an inch of Vaseline. <laughs> it's a very rare occasion that you, a naval officer's sword is ever drawn indoors. This is a very special occasion tonight. Where's the cake? 